All right, so we are live, and uh, we are going to do episode. What number is this? One hundred nine. One hundred nine of podcast PD. Very cool. All right, so the chat is fired up. People are chatting, and uh, we will start the show. Here we go. This is Podcast PD, the show that provides you with anytime, anywhere professional development. Our conversations and guests will provide you with the learning you might get in a faculty meeting or on a PD day. Except you're going to have more fun with AJ Bianco, Stacey Lindis, and me, Chris Nessie. Let's start the show. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening generic time of the day this is podcast pb this is episode 109 and once again i open my mouth and i get cross-eyed looks from my podcast with padres Stacey lindas and aj bianco happy sunday night to you what's up Stacey? all right chris your your mic sounds weird that's what the cross-eyed looks are yeah what do you it's mean? like uh, it sounds like you're in a vacuum or something. There's a in weird a kind of vacuum. A uh, weird kind better. of feedback. There you go. Whatever you did, he fixed it. Didn't touch anything. Perfect. No, it's coming back. It's like a low hum of some kind of weird noise. No, but your your mic sounds better than it did a couple of seconds ago. <laughs> True story. It's True not perfect. Story. Though. Not perfect. That's not what I pay for all this stuff for. It should be perfect. <laughs> No, it sounds like there's like an appliance humming in the background. That's what it is. It's either a vacuum or a microwave, dryer. Keep going. Something that has a weird frequency. Could be a toaster. No. Could be a blender. Toasters don't make that noise Could and blenders an are noisy as F. <laughs> I don't have one of those, so I don't know. Anyway, moving on. Moving beyond. How are you guys? Doing great. Doing great. Yeah. Sunday night. Heading into Thanksgiving. Sunday night. I'm in training. My favorite holiday. This in training? What do you mean? I got a lot of eating to do on Thursday, Chris. <laughs> 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 oh, I got a lot. I got a lot to eat. So I'm get salami. Myself. Not a salami. We don't do. We, <laughs> I might be Italian, but I'm not doing the salami. Uh yeah, big big holiday coming up here in the uh, U.S. of A. Good times. So people might be joining us live as we stream the show here on a Sunday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, out at podcastpd.com slash live. Want to give a couple of shout-outs and hello. Tim Cavey, Teachers on Fire, is out there in the audience. Executive producer Stephanie Scrocky is out there. Mel A. is out there. By the way, thoughts, not thoughts and prayers, but I know Mel is recovering from a uh, medical procedure, so she is on the lam, as it were. No, on the land means she's a running away criminal. Um, she's on the mend. She's on the mend. There we go. <laughs> she's on the mend. So feel better. Mel A. Dave Frangiosa is out there. So life is good. Life is good. Life is good. We are not alone tonight if you're watching this, but uh, let's bring in our special guest for this episode. Special guest, thank you. Special guest. I want to introduce the world to somebody who I've been able to work with since he did a couple of day a week practicum experience back in spring 2021 when I was completely virtual. This young man joined me, I don't know, three days a week when he only needed to do two. And he did like an extra month when he only needed to do like three. And uh, here we are again in the fall semester. He is my sidekick and student teacher, the incomparable Mr. Quinlan Van S. Incomparable. Thank you. It's great it's to be he, here. Not what he said last time, but that's all right. Oh, well, I'm willing well. to bet. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but it's not like I had a choice of doing all those, you know, all that extra time and everything. When I first uh, met Chris Nessie, he kind of, he sat me down, you know, we were on a Zoom interface kind of like this, and, you know, he's sitting in his house wearing, like, whatever ratty New York Yankee shirt he had on, and, you know, 
I was, it was, the school day had just ended. I was expecting a professional in like a button down shirt and tie and everything. This is fantastic. This is and, wonderful. And, you know, I hop on the Zoom. I'm wearing my button down shirt and I'm, I'm ready to chat it up with my new cooperating teacher. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was totally unprepared. And he was like, you know what? We're just throwing you right into the fire. And I was like, yeah, that, that works for me, I guess. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> at, what point did, at what point did you say to him, hey, dude, what's with the bed back there? That <laughs> <laughs> bed is never going to go away. It definitely didn't click for me right away. Cause I'm a college student. I, you know, I work at a desk with a bed right behind me here. So I... Hey. There you go. We got yep. two guys on the show tonight with beds behind them. There we go. And and it wasn't until he like I started commenting like, "Oh, you got that cool thing up on the wall. You got that cool thing up on the wall behind you." And he's like, "Yeah, this isn't like my bedroom. I don't live in like a college guy's dorm room." And I was like, "Oh, yeah, that's right. Not everybody lives in a dorm room." That's this is fantastic. Wow. The secrets the secrets that are coming out here. This is just wonderful. Thank you, Quinn. Thank you for making my night. Yep, perfect. Oh, I've got a lot of insight. Then. Let's do is, it. Yes. If this is already, you know, enough, I got more. Oh, keep but, going. What else? What else would you be willing to share with all I four mean, people who are watching? The first, <laughs> the first conversation I got to have with Nessie here was like very interesting because the graduate school definitely sets us up. This is the Rutgers Graduate School of Education. Uh, they definitely set us up with this idea of like very strict professionalism and all of that. Then you make us. No. <laughs> definitely. Basically. Um, <laughs> like they, they even like have in our manual, like code of conduct that like, regardless of what school policy is, we're supposed to be wearing button downs and ties every single day. And like, that's definitely like kind of what we got used to. They were like, you know, you're going to go do these observations and you got to be on your best behavior. You got to be well-dressed, you know, better dressed than everybody else there. And that's kind of what I was expecting to walk into, like, especially like from a partner district with them and everything. But, um, it was definitely, you know, at first, like just a weird turn on a dime for me, but then definitely refreshing to be like, okay, it's definitely a little bit more laid back here. It's a better environment to work and process things in and really focus on what's important, not on the button shirt and tie. You had to wear a button shirt and tie in your Zoom teaching? Well, that's that's what they prepared us for. Yeah, they were like 100%. That's what you should be wearing. You know, regard like this does not change anything kind of mentality. Like we're just running how we always have been, which like, again, it's like things definitely changed over the pandemic. Like to say like, we're just doing everything by the book, how we've always done it mm -hmm. is uh, not really the way to approach when things just radically change like this. Yeah. I'm thinking about how I'm wearing jeans every day this week. Oh. Got it all planned out. Lucky <laughs> Did that is that costing you money or you're just wearing jeans the three days this week? No, what do you mean costing me money? What does that mean? Well, sometimes <laughs> schools do a donation, so you wear jeans on donation, days. union, fundraiser. Nah, if it rains, I wear jeans. If it's Friday, I wear jeans. If it's Wednesday, I might wear jeans. This where, week, where do these jeans. unicorn Monday, Tuesday, districts exist? Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> I also sit on the floor with little kids. True. Uh, Good point. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. All right. I so let's get let's get into like the real stuff here. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the real stuff. Good job, Dave. Dave has said, Dave, I'm sorry. I totally have to chime in. Dave said he's worn jeans every single day this year. My man. Applause to you, Dave. Applause to you. <laughs> Quinn, why teaching? Well, it kind of uh the first time that I realized that teaching might be like an option for me was kind of like eighth grade. I remember a student teacher actually, you know, was in the class and said to me like, you know, like, oh, you're kind of good with this history stuff. Like, have you considered like doing something with history, like teaching? And I had that moment of like, oh, 
you know, get to stand in front of people and talk about what I like all day. That sounds pretty cool. Um, but I was kind of, I was a boy scout and Eagle scout actually. And that program kind of teaches you like service to others and this idea of like encouraging citizenship and building what other people know. And so very quickly education became more than just talking about what I like all day and became like, okay, I can provide tools and knowledge to other people and that's my job that's mm -hmm. what i get to go and do every day it's a great response i appreciate Thank that you. yeah that's a good one i feel like aj's interviewing for your future job i would never I appreciate that, that. <laughs> <laughs> so why teaching tell us a little bit about yourself Quinn. no i'm kidding mm. um <laughs> So you worked with Chris in the spring and you're working again with him in the fall. Is that miserable? Is that, no, is that typical? <laughs> Do you typically stay with one um, cooperating teacher for both semesters? I think it makes it easier on the graduate school to do it that way. But sure. it's like something that they're like, you know, hey, if you and your cooperating teacher want to work together again, like you both have to specifically say something to us and like tell us and let us know that in advance. So we know to just kind of lump you together because otherwise we'll just randomize it again where they just kind of throw your name into this random district generator and just kind of push you wherever. But definitely working with Nessie in the, in the spring, I was like, this is a place that I'm going to gain, you know, skills, tools, all this really great information, these really great ideas and like a huge freedom, you know, the graduate school kind of sat us down both in the spring and the fall. And we're like, okay, here's the pacing guide for what you as a student teacher should be doing in the classroom. Where like weeks one through five are like, you sit there and watch silently in the back of the classroom. And then after <laughs> that, you can kind of participate a little bit. And then like it eventually works you up to like, maybe you plan and execute like one or two lessons. And it's like, that's, you know, that would be all well and good if that's what my cooperating teacher wants to do, because it is their classroom at the end of the day. I'm walking in and kind of taking over things and, you know, they're putting a lot of trust in me. But at the same time, it's not exactly building you up as quickly as it should. But wait, is that for full student teaching or is that for your for, junior practicum? Like your for, like. For the spring, that's at least what it was, I think, like. Okay. You know, for the fall when you're full time, it was more so, you know, like actual experience very quickly. But still, it was, you know, it set us up for the first like week or two of full time student teaching of like sit back and watch what your student teacher does. And I think that would be more so the case if you were with a different placement. Mm -hmm. Like if I wasn't working with Nessie still, I would definitely need that time to kind of sit back and watch what they're doing and figure out what my place in the classroom is going to be. So I, I, so I was, I asked because like, that seems like an extremely delayed timeline for someone who only has 16 weeks for full time student teaching. But I have another question for you as an elementary teacher, you know, um, and, and having been a cooperating teacher, which Mel, I, I don't know what you would call like the licensed or certified teacher. And then their student teacher, um, where you're from, but yeah, so here we call them cooperating teachers and then um, student teachers or pre-service teachers for those who are in school working towards their certificate. But as an elementary teacher, um, having had a student teacher come in, there's like that, that, I guess, scope and sequence that you're talking about and that pacing guide. Um, but for us, it looks very different because you know, we're all the content, we're all the subject areas. And so it's a gradual build up to the full day of teaching, right? So you might start mm -hmm. with something small and then move into another content area. And then by the end of it, you're teaching all six periods of the day. What does that look like when your content area is one topic? Um, like what is the gradual release there? I think the gradual release was intended to be kind of you – start to dip your toe into classroom procedures, right? You know, you kind of get a sense of how to run and structure the class, right? You know, instead of doing attendance one day, Nessie might turn it over to me. Instead of 
setting the class up and telling them what's expected of them that day, I would do it. Uh, and then eventually working your way up to planning an entire lesson, executing that entire lesson, and then doing that for like maybe even a unit. I don't even think for our spring part-time, a unit was expected of us. Um, so you do parts of a lesson and then you build up. Yes. Okay. Definitely. Um, but the reality between Nessie and I was more so like, you know, Nessie had his plans and I was given the option to either do those or do something else entirely. But we've known Chris part, for years and we know he throws people, everybody, not just you, not just the other student teacher, Luke, but everyone just gets thrown into the deep end and it's like, figure it out, buddy. Press record. Oh, I, hopefully somebody will save your ass. Sorry. I've got, I've gotten that from him. Uh, I can definitely tell that that's who he is. And uh, I'm definitely grateful for that. You know, it was a lot more enriching and provided a lot more for me than if somebody who took that pacing guide very seriously and was like, you're going to wait and kind of get a feel for things. Um, and right from the bat, Nessie and I, uh, he was like, we're not going to tell the students you're a student teacher. You know, they're not going to know. You're just going to do your thing. You're going to be Mr. Van S. I'm Mr. Nessie, and we run the class. Um, but in the spring, when I was only there three days a week, the kids might have gotten a general feel of, hey, maybe this guy isn't, you know, the actual teacher, and maybe Mr. Nessie is, especially since they are in a partner district, and they definitely have student teachers coming in and out of the classroom mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but this year, full-time, right off the bat, you know, we introduced ourselves, you know, Here's Mr. Van S. Here's what he what he's about. Here's Mr. Nessie. Here's what he's about. And uh, Nessie's kind of been very gracious and given me the floor. Right. I have planned all of the units so far this year. Executed them all. Um, relied on certain aspects of what Nessie's done in the past. Things that he showed me. Different units, and then kind of taken my own spin on them, or just kind of run them as close to the vest as possible, and then. You know, a lot of things that I just come up with. And then, you know, even that, Nessie's provided me tools and different pieces of technology, especially, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, kind of run with. And that's all done by design, Stacy and AJ. So, again, next year he gets hired. He goes for that first full-time job. And he does the first day of school. And he's already done the first day of school. It's just that he will then be by himself or he'll have a maybe an in-class support teacher or there'll be maybe a parent or he will be by himself wherever he winds up. And I think that that's important that you experience that. You know, I was certainly in the room. I'm, I'm that safety net if he ever needs it. Um, and he's, you know, spread his wings and he's certainly been given every opportunity to, you know, try different things. And there's times where he will say to me, you know, what should I do? And I'm like, well, you figure it out. Like if you come up with something that's egregious, I'll step in. But for the most part, just try something. Oh, I'm not knocking you, Chris. I just know how you operate in a good way, like mm -hmm. like in a pusher kind of way, right? It's it's mm -hmm. kind of like get your feet wet, figure it out, and then we'll talk afterwards. Um, test the waters. That's a good thing. I'm not, and you're right. Like my student teacher, she came in the spring and she didn't have any of that beginning of the year setup which was fine mm -hmm. for her. Like classroom teaching was not exactly what she was going for. Um, so that, that was also just a different trajectory for her, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, Quinn, if you could speak to what was one of the things I recommended you do every day or a couple of times a week throughout this entire experience that I think any, any teacher or certainly any student teacher would benefit from drinking. <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely recommended that a couple of times but, i was um, thinking beer uh, <laughs> no that that's not what it is uh he recommended journaling you know writing down you know my thoughts and feelings about things that we're doing the results of what we're doing what i think works and what doesn't work and uh Nessie knows me. Nessie uh, knows that I kind of slack off on it. You know, I write in there when I feel it's important, you know, but 
definitely like uh like some of our kids i'm like eh, i'll like when i feel like it that's definitely <laughs> maybe a voice recording would be better i'm surprised oh, he doesn't have you do that right i definitely want to listen to my own voice but you have a great voice you have a good podcasting voice chris hasn't had you uh work towards that yet no one step at a time hmm. were you on twitter before you were chris's student teacher he wasn't on Twitter before 1130 this morning. <laughs> oh, the secrets come out. Yeah. I did see your Twitter handle, so I thought maybe. Uh, okay. Well, he, he's it. brand new. So if you're, again, he is at Mr. Underscore Q Van S. It's on the screen. It'll be in the show notes. But uh, he is new to Twitter. And again, who should he follow? And how can we get him involved in being a connected educator and know that he is not alone he's not he's not alone and he doesn't have to be confined to just my voice and opinion or the the people who he's gotten to know in our department in our building but there's a whole world of people out there who would be willing to help and lend ideas and share resources and just talk to i'm making a i'm making a hard turn here so Quinn, I know this is a lot about you and a lot about you know your relationship with Chris as a student teacher, but I'm going to ask uh, questions from an administrator point of view, and and I think Chris and Stacy, you guys can definitely uh, feel this. So, as a student teacher, right, you're working with a lot of other college students right now. Mm -hmm. How many of your peers have changed their major? or decided not to go into student teaching at this time? Rough estimate. Actually, from the group that I know, zero. Hmm. Um, the group of approximately 30 of us that are doing uh, history education specifically, that are either five-year students or uh, post back students, um, Zero of them have dropped out of the program for reasons other than being hired to do the job. You know, I know of uh, three or four who have been hired into a district already, and the district said, uh, we'll do whatever we need to do to get you your licensing. Just come work for us right away. And uh, primarily partner districts that they had privately set something up with, uh, rather than a placement a partner district that is. Um, so they had these connections already. They knew people in the district. So they had all that set up pretty much. And it was just kind of like, okay, now I need to come in, do my student teaching here for a bit, just enough to show that I am qualified to do the job. And then you give me the job. Hmm. Hmm. But I don't know of anybody who has dropped out. There are definitely some student teachers and uh, Nessie and I have had conversations about this that I have seen who we both have a feeling will not make it that long, not even necessarily because they're not good at it or they don't have the proper skills, but just because this environment does not seem where they would be comfortable, right? Maybe an administrative position or uh, something outside of education, right? Doing history in a different field, political mm -hmm. science, maybe. What's the overall vibe for the people that you are with when it comes to student teaching? If you're taking classes with with college age uh, professionals, um, are they excited? Are they nervous? Uh, like, are they spreading the word of education or are they just kind of doing what they think they could do because they have no other route? Now, I'm very curious what people are thinking these days. You know, there's, um, there's, a, there's a teacher shortage, right? Yeah. And we're trying to find the youth and we're, the youth that we're finding are not experienced and really not very good. So I'm kind of curious, like, I'll be honest. Um, I definitely feel like everybody that's in my cohort is really passionate about what they're doing for the most part. Again, there's definitely that handful that, you know, I don't know if this is quite the right place for them, but who am I to say anything about that? You know, they, they might be really good at it and they might just kind of keep it close to the chest. And, you know, it's just not something that they wear. So hopefully that's the case. But 
Um, for everybody else, there's a few people who are handling all of this experience really well. But for the most part, it seems like it's just tuckering a lot of them out, which is definitely to be expected. Like, this is their first time doing this five days a week, every single day. But then again, like, I talk to them, and it's like they're not planning the lessons. They're not running the show all the time. They're, you know, kind of just helping out with extraneous things every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I get that it's exhausting, but it's like, there's a lot more that you're going to have to be doing in a year. Yeah, that's a bad partnership with limited experience being given mm -hmm. to someone. And that does mm -hmm. not set them up for a successful independent run in the classroom when they graduate. And you guys are near the end, right? You you have, what, four more weeks before the semester's over? Yeah. I think... Uh, he goes through till December 23rd. Yeah, we're okay. told whenever the school you're with starts their winter break, that's it. That's when you're done. Okay. I know my sister um, has a student teacher from TCNJ. And um, again, it's elementary, so it's a little bit different. It's also TCNJ, so I know it's a different university or school, college. Um but they're done in a couple of weeks and she's, you know, like as you start to build up those lessons for the day, she's starting to pull them back. And as that student teacher gets, um, has fewer responsibilities in the classroom. And as my sister takes over more of the teaching in her classroom, um, she, the student teacher will then go out and visit other classrooms just to kind of see what it, what teaching looks like, you know, when you're not with Nessie or when you're not with my sister, you know, and Nessie has helped me to start to set that up where, you know, he sent out an email to the whole department. It was like, hey, who's teaching during our prep period where, you know, my student teacher can go to your classroom and observe. And I definitely saw a couple of different classes. And, you know, as soon as I get back from those observations, Nessie's immediately like, okay, think to yourself, what did you see that worked? What did you see that didn't work? What do you see yourself employing? What are things that you saw that you're like, I never want to do that in my class? And it's, Can I give you, you know, two bits of it of unsolicited advice? Oh, that's what it's all about. Let's hear it. Okay. So if it is during prep, I would say have Chris go with you so that even on the side, he can coach things through, like talk to you mm -hmm. about like why he thinks a teacher might do that. Um, but then also just so he knows exactly what it is that you're talking about. Because like, mm -hmm. I don't know that a lot of teachers are doing the pineapple chart thing anymore and still going into classrooms and... I don't want to, you know, throw shade at you or like speak for you, Chris. I don't know what, what that's like for you. But also I would recommend, even though you're in the history department, going out and seeing other content area, you know, go into other humanities. Um, language arts is a great place to go. Don't be afraid to go into a math classroom. It's completely unrelated. You're never going to get the content, but just someone's classroom management trick might be like the thing that sticks with you the most. And as a new teacher, those are also the things that you need. You need your content, but you need to know how to connect and like herd children into a way that like works for all of you. Um, and that is not necessarily a history department thing. Definitely. Thank you. I love that too. Just to now I'm like, all right, who can I email and that are in other content areas? And I already know who I can email. So I, I will send him hunting in the next couple of weeks. Definitely. Yeah. But, but uh, Stacy, uh, one point you made was that I should go with him and I don't want to. Why? He likes his prep period. <laughs> well, there's that. No, <laughs> but so like when, when he's come back, the, these hand, these handful of times, you know, I know who he's going to see. So I never actually have him talk to me about what he saw from one of my colleagues' classrooms. I just mm -hmm. give him things to think about like, what did you see in the classroom that you feel you might like to emulate and think to yourself, are there things that you saw that you're like, either that's not me or I would never do that, but to be reflective to yourself. So I don't know that I would want to be another body in the room, especially now with, you know, social distance and all that crap. But I don't know that I would want to be another body in the classroom where maybe a colleague might feel uncomfortable that I'm in there, right? but are okay with a student teacher coming in because it's non judgy. I mean, you would Plus, definitely have to get permission, but mm -hmm. I just think that there's value to it. Yeah, definitely. 
and just with anything like that you know nowadays like well at any time like the more people that come into a classroom that aren't supposed to be there the more eyes are on them everybody's like oh what's going on who's this person? Yeah. <laughs> why are they here and kids are pretty distractible i didn't notice that really <laughs> But that's that's been something to deal with, like, and I expected it, but like just distractions, distractions everywhere for these kids. You know, I remember back like when I was in high school and like even before that, like we didn't have Chromebooks or anything. And like the schools were always pretty strict about like phones in your pockets. But even then, like until like high school cell phones and smartphones weren't really a problem. But like, you know you would still be like, okay, I'm going to stare at that poster on the wall for this entire class and just make it through. But now kids will be, you know, looking like they're doing something and they're playing snake on their computer. But yeah, definitely like just staying on top of kids, you know, and you definitely can get a feel pretty quick of like, these are the kids who are going to stay on top of their work. These are the kids who, you know, aren't and you kind of need that little extra push but um that was something that nessie kind of helped set up at the start of the year where the first unit that we did you know he kind of urged me to take a step back let them work it out on their own and then based on the results of that kind of get a sense of okay these are the kids who are going to need that extra little push these are the kids who are going to be able to fly on their own right off the bat you know, and it'll be about dragging those kids a little bit further to grow. And then the other kids who, you know, kind of definitely need that extra support, making sure that that's always there for them. Do you think your your program has prepared you well enough for, uh, for school? Have they taught you tips and tricks to be helpful to engage students, get them interactive? Or are you just, you know, is it more learning on the go? Uh, to put it simply, I don't know what TCNJ's uh, five-year program is like, but I'm going to recommend people to t go to TCNJ. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean... Are, are, it, you in the, are you in the special ed program? Is that what your five-year program is for? No, I'm just social studies. Um, and it's a five-year program? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But The five-year... The, after four years, he graduated with his degree in history and here in this fifth year he gets all the education stuff the uh the the student teaching and then in the spring they only student teach full-time in the fall and then he's got classes to take in the spring and then in the next spring he's got his master's degree and my my senior year for my bachelor's like was also half chock full of education courses and then this past summer also different education courses. That's interesting. Cause I think the TCNJ five-year program um, is a five-year master's for special ed. Ah, okay. I don't think it's just a five-year program for, for gen ed or um, like high school, secondary. Okay. But, but I would venture a guess that most teacher prep programs, even for hours, you know, if we, if we, if the three of us think back to learning what we learned in our teacher prep program versus what we learned when we actually did observations or what we did when we did student teaching or what we learned in our first year in the classroom. You know, we certainly learned a lot more when we were in the frying pan as opposed to not in the frying pan. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. I understand what you're saying, but I feel like also like I, I still will go back to this. I feel like our programs of higher ed are not doing a good job preparing our teachers. Well, that's they the point I'm know. making. Right. No, I know. I'm just saying. Okay. I asked him that question. You're looking at Mike's here, like, no, does any program do this? No, no program does this. Everybody is just, you know, teaching them the basics, teaching them what it looks like to be in a classroom, teaching them what it looks like to deal with students. But nobody is telling us how to engage students or how to write a really good lesson plan or how to, you know, make those connections or where to go or where to turn. You know, they 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 may rely too heavily on the uh, the student teaching part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know, student teachers may just be nervous getting in a classroom. Yeah. Um, I definitely agree that like stuff like 
you know, how to engage students, all that stuff was, is lacking in the program. And like you said, like, that's the kind of stuff that you don't really get from programs. That's just kind of stuff that you need to learn. Well, that they're forcing you to learn through all these different programs, like, you know, through experience. But I feel, <laughs> sorry, you go. No, you go. Okay. Um, but I feel like the biggest problem with the graduate school is that they kind of set themselves up as these, you know, like all knowing gods in a way of like, you know, we know what you need to do. We know everything that's right and wrong. And let's give you all this information. Like, I remember, you know, one thing that was really like, you know, focused on and that they kind of really hyped up was um, this like twigs, uh, twigs, trees, forest model of like, you know, finding the forests, like the, these big ideas. And then, you know, the trees being like these more general loose topics. And then the twigs are like all the small details that you need to jam pack in there. And while that's kind of an effective way to set up for lecture style education of just standing up and force feeding all these twigs to students, like in a more modern, you know, especially thematic, like project based style of education, anything that's not traditional, like it becomes difficult to do that. And they're not really providing us any information on how to do that. It seems like everything is kind of setting us up that lecture is the only way to do it. You stand up there and talk at kids and sometimes you engage them. And that's kind of how it's been focused and forced to us. And I definitely see that with a lot of my cohort of mm -hmm. people coming back and saying like, you know, I'm planning out all these elaborate lessons and, you know, making these slideshow presentations and stuff. And on the other hand, I'm like, I'm in front of the kids, maybe five minutes out of a class explaining what they need to do. And then I'm engaging with them one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. letting them kind of lead themselves. I'm still giving them that content knowledge, but it's a lot fewer twigs, you know, it's more streamlined, you know, this twig connects directly to this tree that connects directly to this forest rather than trying to force them to dig through all the brush to get to what the point is. I and there's wonder... also, uh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go, Chris. No, I, I was going to say also in these teacher prep programs, you know, where there is a severe lack of educational technology preparation. Quinn, I will ask you, have you taken any course that <clears throat> focused on ed tech and its use in the classroom? I have. Uh, it was education and computers. I think was the name of the course and it was taught by um an IT guy and he was very nice but not an educator very nice that... I want to I want to reassure <laughs> that he was one of the sweetest guys I've met in the graduate program but he's not an educator and so we actually spent like a whole class and this was like a three-hour class meeting once a week so we only had like 15 meetings, he spent an entire class on here's how you take apart and reconstruct a computer. And so it was like, so what you're saying, Quinn, is you can fix our kids Chromebooks and I don't need to send them out to the library <laughs> to get them fixed. <laughs> a, a computer, not a Chromebook. I, I can, you know, the whole big box I can take apart, but a laptop oh, like, like a Dell tower. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Chris, I'm hearing two things. I'm hearing you need to propose like an apps for education type class. My high schoolers have to take that, or actually they took it as middle schoolers. Um, something that is kind of trendy in a way of like, here's why we use technology and focus in on the why and not the what, but and the what becomes a secondary factor because that's the thing that changes the most. Right. Like you don't want to like build a whole course on how to use Flipgrid and then tomorrow Flipgrid's like a paid thing and everybody's, you know, in trouble. But mm -hmm. like um, I remember one of the most beneficial classes I took as a grad student because my my certification program was like a two year graduate program because I graduated without a degree for teaching. Um, 
but it was um, trends in education. And I thought that that was helpful because I think the thing that I think um, to answer your question, AJ, one of the reasons that schools or colleges under prepare is because if you over prepare in one area, um, especially at my level, where like you are teaching everything, right? You can't go specifically into a reading program because if I'm doing one reading program uh, as a as a student teacher, that might not be what I'm hired to teach later, right? Mm-hmm. Or if I'm like learning how to teach spelling or word study this way, that might not serve me. So it's it's like all of the methods courses are meaningful, but they don't necessarily get into the nitty gritty of like how your district where you're hired is going to be doing that thing, right? And so, Quinn, you're talking about like, yeah, you know, Chris is giving you this great experience of not giving lectures, really being a guide on the side and letting the kids explore history through a thematic lens, a thematic lens, which, you know, I don't think every history teacher is doing. And, you know, that could be kind of tricky later too, you know, like I think that's yeah. why schools don't necessarily say like, this is the one way. Um, but Chris, I really think you need to teach that class on how to use computers. Like the tr- my trends in education class, I learned so many different things that were relevant 20 years ago. It would look very different in, in the current like teaching climate. Mm-hmm. The one right. thing that I... Colleges and universities that are watching, just hit me up. I'm more than happy to design right. courses. And- you need to teach apps for education, and you need to teach trends in education, and then boom, done. Plus, you know your your communication classes that you teach, and the sex history you. classes. And, and, and you get a full time right. job at some university. You know, make sure you put me down as a recommendation for like the person to take over your position. <laughs> We've had many conversations about if I can go. It's convenient now because we got somebody who could just step right in. Well, we'll be able, we might actually be able to lie and be like, actually, Mr. Nessie was a student teacher from Rutgers this entire time. He's going <laughs> to, he, he's done with his placement. He's leaving. It is one bald guy with glasses versus another bald guy with glasses. Oh, I, I tell the kids, I'm like, that's why they set us up together. I, you know, I say like they wanted just the two bald guys with glasses, you know, working together. And it's super insulting when they mix us up. <laughs> oh, but I think I think that's mostly because like they just don't know any of our names. That's true. <laughs> you know, like one kid came up to us and said to me, like, oh, Mr. Nessie, can I go to the bathroom? And I was like, Mr. Who? And he's like, Oh, the other one's Mr. Nessie. I'm like, what's my name? And he was just like, mm. I'm like, <laughs> I'm the guy who posts everything on Google Classroom. I'm the guy who gets up and says hi to you every morning. What is going on right now? What is what is happening? But hey, at least they're learning something. If not my name, it's something. And, and they are learning. Uh, you know, again, we're, you know, almost through this experience and these kids are performing really well. And I think that's a testament to one Quinn's content knowledge. And again, the class isn't heavily rooted in content, but in terms of the art of teaching, which I've talked about in the past, you know, Quinn is not is has a good grasp on that and will continue to develop his his voice with students his presence in the classroom and you know certainly he'll walk away from this experience having a good idea of what he wants a classroom to look like i'm sure some of what he's done he would like to repeat and i'm sure there's some things that maybe if he was completely by himself he would do and i'll I'll say it right now pretend i'm not there do what you want try it the only thing I go to Nessie for anymore is uh, to put grades in the system. And even then I go to him, I'm like, it's time for grades. And he's like, I'm, I'm busy. Like I'm playing snake over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I knew uh, it. that's why he doesn't go on his prep to watch, yeah. you know, watch those other like, teachers. I'm close to a new high school. Come on, <laughs> mister, please. I'm also designing tasks and challenges for him to do. And actually this was something I picked up from uh, my former in-class support teacher, Brian, who, when he worked with a student teacher with another cooperating teacher, he would give the person little challenges. So I've taken that and made it a part of what I do. So like last week, Quinn designed a bulletin board 
that uh, not in the classroom, but like a display out in the, uh, the hallway, which he did a nice job on. And, uh, that was fun. What other assignments have I given you? I don't know. I think the entire class has been an assignment so far. That's true. But like, um, he'll wait, ask you call me questions. It a like, challenge, Chris? You call like that a challenge? Like, oh, are, are I you mean, trying to make it fun and gamify it? Because like bulletin boards? Yes, I want him to stink. level up as we go. Yes. Bulletin boards are the worst. He's giving you the grunt work. Don't fall like, for it. He, like, I had just like start, started wrapping up this like really great lesson that we had done. You know, where the kids were, like, super engaged. Like, they did round tables when, like, they started off the year not knowing how to talk. And so, you know, doing all this really great stuff. And he just, like, comes up and whispers in my ear, like, super seriously, like, I have a mission for you. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I don't even want to know what this mission is. Like, this, like, I don't want to do it. And he's like, go stand out at the door and tell me what you see in the hall. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I see students walking around. He's like, you see that empty bulletin board over there? You're going to put something in that. I'm like, I'm the least artistic person I know. This is not fun. And uh, I did it, though. It's and what you come up Instagram help. <laughs> Tell them what you came up with. So, uh, you know, it was actually based on this set of T-shirts that Nessie and I and a whole bunch of other people in the history department ordered. Off of like the school site, you know, that say like make history on it. And it's got like our zebra logo and all of that. And so I was like, I'm just going to lift that. And so I, I stole that design, you know, put that on a couple of pieces of paper, you know, make history real big in the center. And then I wanted to do famous, lesser known people from throughout history. And Nessie was like, make it more specific, find people from, you know, our town. And so I did that. And you know, on one side, it's different, like three different people and like their names who were either from New Brunswick or like spent a majority of their time in New Brunswick, like seriously impacted the city. And then on the other side, a whole list of podcasts, you know, like four different history podcasts that they can just scan this QR code and brings them immediately to the site and they can listen to different topics, you know. So I have a challenge for you. Oh, when no. tomorrow morning you have to go in and take a picture of your bulletin board and post it on your new Twitter account so we can all see it. And then you have to hashtag podcast PD and uh, we'll all find it that way. More homework. I love it. More homework. Welcome to podcast PD. Thank you. That's why I love Stacy. I love you, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, Christopher. I definitely... <laughs> You know, started off being like, yeah, these two are going to get it. We're going to gang up on Nessie this entire time. And then by the end of it, y'all are like, yeah, here's some more homework. We're <laughs> just like him. You just have to take a picture. It's easy peasy. Nice. <laughs> All right. Real quick, before we uh, start to go towards the exit on this episode, want to give a shout out to this episode's sponsor and our current presenting sponsor, StreamYard which is how we make this live stream go. So StreamYard lets you live stream to multiple platforms. You can stream to Facebook. You can stream to YouTube. You can stream to Twitter. You can stream to LinkedIn and Twitch. And fun fact, tonight, we for the first time, we are streaming to LinkedIn. It's my LinkedIn, but we're streaming to LinkedIn right now. So there you go. StreamYard makes it super easy. We can do the graphics you see here on the screen. And uh, if you want to try out StreamYard for your live stream endeavors, go to podcastpd.com slash StreamYard. And thank you to StreamYard for sponsoring Podcast PD. AJ, you have a LinkedIn, right? I do. Yeah. I don't have that one. So Twitch, StreamYard, no, Twitch, LinkedIn, YouTube, and what else? Facebook? Twitter. Twitter. It's a lot. Well, tonight we're Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. In all those places, we have three people. So thanks, people. Aw, AJ. <laughs> we love our listeners. We love our listeners. We appreciate all three of you. Listen. <laughs> That's people who attend live. People download this saying, after the you. fact. I was going to say, saying. I'd be listening to this on a Wednesday, not live. You don't listen to it at all. <laughs> I just do, too. 
Hey, if you're not subscribed, go to podcastpd.com slash go. All right. AJ, any more um, Quentin questions? I've peppered him with enough questions. You're taking your admin hat off? I'm taking it off right now. Yeah, I don't want to scare the guy. Not even any Yankees questions. He has a Yankee shirt on. I know. That's a different podcast. He's a bro. Different show. Different show. Different show. Sorry. Do you have more questions for Quinn, Stacy? No, I think I, I, I think I scared him, and I gave him too much homework. Oh, you can't. Like I said, y'all can't scare me that easily. I got <laughs> Nessie breathing down my neck every single day. Nobody, nobody scares me at this point. Oh, that's you haven't scary. gotten a teacher look yet. Yeah, that's not scary. It's just annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it's been fun. You know, I I relish this as a professional. You know, I think this is something that any teacher, once eligible, should go through and be a cooperating teacher, either to have somebody come in and observe like you did in the spring. But definitely any teacher should mentor a pre-service teacher and be a cooperating teacher or a supervisor, whatever it is, should experience this. And I think it's one of the ultimate ways that we as professionals can give back to our profession by trying to pass on our experiences, our knowledge, and just try and help somebody else get into this. Who's got the desire to get into this. So I think that's important. I mean, I know I definitely want to do a demo line, you know, Mm -hmm. and definitely that idea that, you know, even though like, especially me, but everybody in education, like we don't know exactly what we're doing. Like we might have a very firm idea of like, this is what we do and this works. And we think this is the best and being open to adapt and everything, but still like, you know, that need to acknowledge that like we try our best. It is not a hundred percent and it never will be, you know, at least not in reality, we can dream, but you know, that openness to like this is the way i do it you can see this you know but definitely reaching out seeing other voices seeing other you know methods of doing things and uh just getting a general sense of everything as much that's as perfect you know. right because there's always more there's always something different and a lot of times it might be a little bit better or it could be a lot better You're in good hands, Quinn. These next five weeks, four weeks that you have, wow, before Christmas, that's a, that's tough. I thought we mm-hmm. I thought we ended like the week before, like whenever the semester ended, that's when our student teaching was over. So. And, and, and I think the other important piece here is, you know, not just me, but again, he's done a great job and any student teacher should, in the school year student teaching in, get to know other professionals in the building. I think Quinn has done an admirable job uh, becoming a part of the department. You know, I don't need to, he, we're not inseparable. So I, I don't need to babysit him throughout the day with other professionals in, you know, the break room or, you know, any other time he can hold his own. He can have a conversation. He has engaged with other people in the department professionally, personally, and, Again, that's not something that any teacher prep program is going to explicitly tell you, A, to do that, or B, how to do that. You just kind of know as a human being that it's probably a good idea to interact with other human beings and build relationships, and he's done a really good job with that. So certainly that's something I didn't teach him. I just gave him the opportunity and the space to be himself, and his personality certainly comes through to the kids, and it comes through to the other people that we work with together. It's good. But I definitely feel like that's, you know, that's a kind of area that a lot of student teachers definitely have difficulty with of just kind of that, you know, like they know who they are as people, but then as teachers, like that's a whole different thing. And kind of that idea that you're crafting a persona almost for the classroom and not instead like, letting as much of who you genuinely are into the class as possible. 
like there's definitely things that we as teachers need to hold back. Like we can't just be ourselves a hundred percent in the classroom, you know, but letting as much of who we are as opposed to trying to craft that perfect, you know, Mr. Or Miss in the classroom, like that is, you know, something that we don't get enough of, of being told like, be yourself, you know, be genuine because the kids can tell when you're not. Well, then I'm going to ask you this. Mm. Is there a difference in how I act in front of the kids versus other than language? <laughs> is there a difference in how I act? Is Do you, do I have different personalities? I don't really think as so. you just said. When, what I do notice is how scary you get. That's definitely something I see with the students a lot more. Not, not all the time, but like when a kid needs a good scaring, that's, <laughs> I, I see that kind of flick of flick of a switch where it's like, okay, you know, like within the first couple of days, there was this one kid, you know, a chatty Kathy, you know, innocent enough. And, you know, he's talking and we find out that he's in whatever sport. And Nessie's like, oh, like, you like doing the sport? You know, like, oh, that's fun. You know, like, that coach is my best friend. And we talk a lot. And we talk about our students and what they're like in the classroom. And they got to be good students if they want to keep playing the sport. And I was like, did you mean to scare the crap out of him? Like, is that what that was? And he was like, oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> and it yep. worked. Just like the other day, uh, one class that we have what just became a split class. So I'll, I'll set that up real quick. So based on us having four lunch periods, not to talk about lunch and make AJ upset, but my, our second class of the day was a five, six class. Okay. Where the kids had our class and then they would go to the seven lunch. Lunches are overwhelming at this point. Uh, one lunch is bigger. So there's some imbalance. So in order to ease that, the school decided we're going to change some five, six classes into five, seven classes. So the class now you have class, the kids go to lunch and then they come back for the rest of class. So it's like 40 minutes, go to lunch, come back for 40 minutes. I told these kids on the, the, the day this became official, which was this past Thursday, I said, we announced this ahead of time. It was in our Google classroom. Let me explain two things to you. Number one, when lunch is over, you get back to this room as fast as possible because time is of the essence. Lunch is already interrupted, whatever we're doing. So you need to get back here as fast as possible. Two, don't ever decide you're not going to come back for the second half of class. Here's my quote. May God have mercy on your soul and what you will face if you decide to cut the second half of class. I think, I think it was scarier in some classes because some classes he didn't use the quote or at, rather like uh, he used the quote with some kids and then not with other kids. But he was like, you don't even want to know what will happen if you do not come back to this. And like the way he said it, like I could never pass that off, but something clicked in him where it was just like the most genuine, scary thing I've ever seen. Quinn, it's not an act. I genuinely mean, do not decide to not come back. Oh, I there know there will be you know. severe consequences. But it was like Marlon Brando over here, just clicking on. Suddenly, he's you know in the jungle of Vietnam, just ready to go. I don't know how you decided that Marlon Brando would be in the jungles of Vietnam. Not the Godfather. Oh. <laughs> Apocalypse <laughs> Now. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I was cool. thinking Godfather too. Mm -hmm. I know, right? <laughs> it's like, I knew okay. where you were going with that. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody knew. Yeah. Somebody. A AJ's on top of that pop culture. Yeah, I, I got the movies. <laughs> AJ, why don't you give uh, Quinn that little piece of trivia for that movie that Stacy and I always fail at? I bet you uh, he's never uh, seen uh, it. This this is not this is not authentic. Now I can't just throw it out there. You can. Yeah, it's, no, it's no, not the right time of year for it. No, it's not the right We're time. getting pretty close, yeah. though. And he can wait. Let's hear it. No, ah, can't do okay. it. I can't, can't do it. Sorry, I can't I'll, hit you, I'll hit you another time. I, I just can't we'll, throw it out there. It's like We'll bring you back in January. Completely <laughs> off topic of where we're at right now. 
Well, okay. Let, let's put it back on the rails and, uh, you know, we're coming up on the uh, end of the show here and we would be remiss if we did not shout out our executive producers. So huge shout out to those that support us by throwing us some money, which we greatly appreciate it helps to keep the lights on here at podcast PD. So shout out to our executive producers, Mike Brilla, Stephanie Scrocky, Sandy Hartman. If you get value from podcast PD and you want to give value because we gave you value, go to podcastpd.com slash executive producer, and you can support the show on a monthly or a yearly basis. If you support the show at any level, everybody gets an exclusive executive producer sticker. And if you support the show for a year, you'll get the sticker and we will send you a podcast PD mug and a podcast PD t-shirt. Thank you again to our executive producers and go to podcastpd.com slash executive producer for more information. We appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, ooh. All right, Stacy, do the magic. All right. Um, yeah, so it is 930. We are going to say goodbye. Say goodbye, AJ. Goodbye, AJ. Say goodbye, Christopher. Goodbye, Christopher. Say goodbye, Quinn. Goodbye, Quinn. Bye, Podcast PD. All right, everything. We are still live, but uh, none of this makes it into the released episode, as you all know. So thank you for coming out. Stephanie, Mel A, Dave Frangiosa, Stephanie. Uh, Tim said what's up and never said anything again. So who knows if he's still watching. But Tim, thanks for stopping by. We appreciate you. Teacher's on fire. Wait, Canada's I number one Mel education was podcast. About. What was Mel talking about? She said that um, I've never been asked for good reason. I think that was when we were talking about teachers being asked to be cooperating teachers, to mentor uh, student teachers. Okay. I don't know. The first time I got that email, I was like, yes, I'll do that. I'll try it. Someone came into my room. I was like, you sure you want me? They're like, yes. I was like, okay. <laughs> we don't do student teachers anymore, so I'll never have a student teacher again. One of uh, the people in my cohort who were, or it, who's in our building was going to be set up with like the same person or somebody else. And then like last minute because of some paperwork issue, like they just got someone with the exact same, uh, uh, Oh my goodness. It's your initials. Yeah. Oh, the exact same initials in oh, the no. history department and just kind of, and we're like, Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's who you're with now. <laughs> well, there, there was another one, uh, but uh, the cooperating teacher didn't feel right mentoring as a student teacher because the certifications weren't exact. So yeah. All right. Well, let me end the live part of this, and then we can certainly chat for a minute or two as we uh, do this. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another live broadcast and uh, enjoy re-listening to this on the download side coming up on Wednesday. Peace out, audience. <laughs>